Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Fernando, AGP in the UK. Today we're going to look at what to do when we encounter an isolated raised alkaline phosphatase level in a patient who is asymptomatic. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Right, so let's dive into it. Before we start, let's remember that alkaline phosphatase is present in various tissues, including the liver, bone, kidneys, intestine and placenta. Reference ranges can vary with age and gender, so mild increases may not indicate disease. Examples of physiological causes are growth spurts in adolescents, pregnancy in women, age-related increases and medications like some antibiotics, antiepileptics, antihistamines, estrogens and steroids. Possible causes of isolated raised alkaline sosotase include congested heart failure, bone diseases, hyperthyroidism and end-stage renal disease. Right, so let's have a look at our patient. She's a 49-year-old lady who has had some blood tests because she was feeling a little tired. Her results have come back all normal with the exception of an alkaline phosphatase level of 186, the normal range being between 30 and 130. Physical examination was normal and that there were no signs or symptoms of disease. In addition, she does not drink alcohol at all. What should be our next steps? The baseline investigations for someone with an isolated alkaline phosphatase level, which is raised, is the following tests. Liver function tests, adding gamma GT, calcium and phosphorus, adding vitamin D and PTH, renal and thyroid function tests, and a full blood count. We know that the most likely sources of alkaline phosphatase are either the bone or the liver. And in order to differentiate between them, this is why we need to measure gamma GT, which is typically elevated in liver issues, and vitamin D levels and PTH levels, which may point towards bone causes. So for this patient, we will need to repeat the alkaline phosphatase level, and we will need to check gamma GT, vitamin D and parathyroid hormone to try and determine the cause, as well as making sure that the other tests, that is, renal and thyroid function tests, calcium, phosphorus and a full blood count have also been checked. We will talk more about our patient a little later, but now let's say that in general terms, if all these tests come back normal, further investigations can be deferred for three months, during which alkaline phosphatase levels should be rechecked. Rechecking it earlier than three months is generally unnecessary unless you have specific concerns. If alkaline phosphatase is raised with an elevated gamma GT level, it's likely to be of hepatic origin. Further steps that we will need to consider include an abdominal ultrasound scan to check for cholestasis and hepatic space occupying lesions, and anti-mitochondrial antibodies to explore the possibility of primary biliary cirrhosis. However, if these liver investigations are normal and the alkaline phosphatase level is, is less than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, observation and monitoring every 3 to 6 months is recommended. However, if the alkaline phosphatase level is more than 1.5 times the upper reference limit and hepatic origin is suspected, referral for further liver investigations is recommended. Now, if the gamma GT levels are normal, the raised alkaline phosphatase level is most likely to be a non-hepatic source, often bone-related. This can be due to vitamin D deficiency, Paget's disease of bone, or growth spurts in adolescence. And how do we manage this? Obviously, if the vitamin D levels are low, we will treat the deficiency accordingly. And if there's any abnormality in the PTH levels, we will also manage it and investigate it further. If vitamin D and PTH levels are normal, and if the alkaline phosphatase level is less than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, and we have no other clinical concerns, then observation and monitoring every three to six months is usual enough. However, for those with non-hepatic alkaline phosphatase level, which is more than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, bone scintigraphy may be considered to detect conditions like asymptomatic Paget's disease of the bone. In cases of diagnostic uncertainty and significant increases in serum alkaline phosphatase levels, checking alkaline phosphatase isoenzymes will be considered. 
This will be more precise in determining the origin of the raised levels. So there we have it, a guide on what to do when you encounter isolated raised alkalized phosphatase levels. But what happened to our patient? Repeat testing showed normal results including gamma GT, vitamin D and PTH, but the alkaline phosphatase went from 186 to 204. Her history and examination remained unremarkable, but she started to complain about some abdominal discomfort. Because of the further rise in the alkaline phosphatase level and her symptoms, as a precaution, an ultrasound of the abdomen was arranged, as well as another check of the alkaline phosphatase level six weeks later. The results showed that the alkaline phosphatase level was still high, but it had decreased slightly to 191, and an ultrasound scan showed steatosis of the liver. So we conclude that she has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFOLD. Although her liver function tests and gamma GT results were normal, it is likely that the raised alkaline phosphatase level is due to this. By the way, if you're unsure about how to diagnose and manage NAFOLD, please check the corresponding episode on this channel. And because her alkaline phosphatase level is less than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, we will monitor her every three to six months. Remember that this is not medical advice, it is only my summary of the guidelines consulted and you must use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.